one of our strengths as a congregation, and I think it's true of um, most United Methodist churches, is that we're a congregation that welcomes everybody. So if you're liberal or conservative or anywhere in between, you're welcome in a United Methodist Church. Now, I I realize that um, there are lots of churches where people all kind of agree with each other, but the United Methodist Church isn't one of them. We are what's called a a big tent, meaning that we have diversity in the church, and that diversity, of course, includes political diversity. So that means that you can come to worship, And uh, either in the old days when we would gather uh, in the building or gather online, and there will be weeks where you will think to yourself, uh, that sermon, uh, that pastor, uh, that church is too liberal or not liberal enough. That church is too conservative or not conservative enough. That church talks too much about politics or not enough about them. In fact, like every pastor, I have preached a sermon where afterward someone has said to me, that was too political. And the same sermon on the same day, someone has said, that was a real disappointment. You didn't take it far enough. Welcome to the world, right? We see things in a variety of ways. We don't all see things eye to eye. Here's the thing, though. Lots of times, because we don't see things eye to eye, we might leave hurt or upset, angry. We might feel like uh, this isn't the place for me because they don't believe exactly the same way I do. But what if God had more for us here? What if, in fact, God called us to be together, especially if we don't see eye to eye? What if that diversity we see in the world should also be in the church? Diversity, as we talked about last week, around race, but also diversity, as we're talking about this week, around around politics, around how we see the world, how we understand things. Last week, we began our new series, but we don't see eye to eye. And we are talking about this because we're in this tumultuous time. And and our goal is that over these weeks, you would hear some things that would help you bring your faith and your politics together. As I explained last week, my role isn't to stand in judgment on your politics or to think you should have a different opinion. My role is to help you look at what you think politically through the eyes of your faith and also to help you have loving relationships with people who see things differently than you do. I believe, actually, that our seeing eye to eye, our agreeing with each other, was never the purpose or point. I don't think it was ever actually a possibility. I think the point is not for us to agree with one another. The point is not for us to be of one mind because uh, we each have our own mind. I think the point, the real point of all of this is much bigger than that. I think the point is to love even when we disagree. The point is to be in relationship even when it's hard. The point is to work for justice even though We may understand justice differently. The point in all of this is to follow Jesus. And how we do that is going to look differently, depending on where we sit, where we stand, our own experience. Last week I shared with you 
a couple things that I think about in times like these, and I want to share them with you again, and my hope is that they're helpful to you as you try to navigate the time. The first is that I value relationships over agreement, and the second is that I value Jesus' kingdom over my comfort. Both of these statements push me past where I might normally fall, where I might be most comfortable. When I talk about valuing relationships over agreement, that pushes me past my habit of needing to be right. It also pushes me past a bad habit I have sometimes of thinking that people who think differently are just wrong. Valuing Jesus' kingdom over my comfort helps me remember that there are important things I need to be doing and that they will often be uncomfortable and push me past what I would want to do. They're often the call to care, to serve, and to love. Today, we are talking about an additional piece in all of this. We're talking about moving from being an either-or kind of person and a kind of orientation to a both-and orientation to life and people. So let's hear our text, and then we'll jump in. Then each of them went home, while Jesus went on to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all of them, he said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. Go away, and from now on, do not sin again. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This familiar text reminds us of how Jesus dealt with people. So let's look at each of the groups of people. First, we have the religious people of the day, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes. In this text, it's the scribes and the Pharisees who are showing up. They have come to Jesus because they know this woman is wrong, and they know that what she has done should lead to her being put to death. In other words, they know their Bible. They know the sin and the result. They also have brought this to Jesus with their either-or thinking. And they're basically saying to Jesus, either you know the right thing to do, and you do it, or you're not sent by God. Second person in the text is, of course, the woman. We don't know a lot about her. We just know her sin, what has gotten her into this situation. Interestingly, though, it does take two to commit adultery, and the man is not there. And then we have Jesus. Now, Jesus knows what the Scripture says. He knows what the law of Moses told them to do in situations like this. But he's a both-and kind of thinker. 
He sees the woman and the sin and the opportunity. And as a both and thinker, he pauses for a moment and then says to the group who are there, let anyone among you who is without sin to be the first to cast the stone. It causes them all to pause and think too. They leave and just the woman is left. We are ourselves often either or kinds of thinkers. We think things like either she gets her way or I get mine. We think either you're at fault or I am. Either you're right or you're wrong. Either I'm successful or I'm a failure. Either you're with me or you're against me. Either it's true or it's not. And either I take mine or someone else will get it. We are, I think by nature, either or kinds of speakers, kinds of thinkers, kinds of people. And in some situations, it's helpful. But in a lot of situations, it's not so great. People, life, is really a lot more complicated than either or thinking would lead us to believe. I've mentioned a TED Talk that had a great effect on me. It's the TED Talk called The Danger of the Single Story. And in it, Chiamanda Adichie speaks about how we often have this either or thinking, this single story we tell about people, this broad stroke that we paint of one another. She says, the single story reduces all the complexity of a place or a people group into a single dimensional image that may capture some small part of the picture but over time begins to stand in for the whole picture. How do we create a single story of a group of people? Well, we show people as one thing and only one thing, and we repeat it over and over again, creating this kind of people are this only. Either or thinking is a big part of this mentality. It is easy for us to put people in categories. People are good or people are bad. People are right or people are wrong. But of course, it's usually way more complex than that. Why do we do this? Why are we so comfortable dividing people like this? Scientists say that it's actually something we do naturally and normally. It is easier for us to put people in hard and fast categories. It's one of the ways that our brain thrives because it makes our life easier when we do that. It makes it easier for us to assess a situation if people are good or they are bad instead of they are a mix of both. When we get into this two-dimensional thinking, this leads to immaturity. It leads to stagnation. And in today's text, one of the things we see is it leads to spiritual self-righteousness. When we are both and thinkers... It changes us. It actually opens doors. Both and thinking invites creative ways of looking at things. It invites us to learn from our mistakes. Both and thinking invites us into deeper thinking. And it helps us push past a scarcity, kind of a scarcity mentality we develop, and also a blame 
mentality we often have. Both and thinking opens up new possibilities. And when we don't see eye to eye, it is a really helpful skill for us to have. So how might we move more into both and thinking? A couple ideas. First one is this. Respect others' perspectives. Now, I know that sounds super, super basic, <laughs> but it is often what is missing in our conversations, and that's because it takes humility. It takes an openness to another's experience. Try this experiment with me wherever you are today. Oh. Lift your arm in the air and point your finger and make your finger go in a clockwise direction. And now move your arm down till you can see it from the top instead of the bottom. What happens? Our clockwise moves and becomes counterclockwise because our Perspective has changed. Perspective is something that is something that we all have. We all have perspective based on a lot of complicated things. Our perspective is based on where you grew up, what your, what your family valued. Our perspective is based on the education we have, the experiences that life brings us. All of these affect our perspective. There is an old saying, where you stand depends on where you sit. And I think that might be true. Jesus' perspective in our text today to this woman who's been caught in adultery And how he deals with it may have struck people as standing against the law of Moses, what Moses had told them to do, what the Bible's clear and simple teaching was. But really, what Jesus was about was something much bigger. He was inviting people to a deeper understanding And he is inviting people to see the heart of God. When you and I practice a both and mentality, we're able to recognize another person's perspective. And in that, we are able to see their heart and not just their actions. Next, realize that this is hard work, but that we can do hard things. I say this because it is tough out there. This is especially a tough season um, with all of the politics going around. It is easy and natural to put other people's thoughts and opinions down in this time. As followers of Jesus, we're called to more, and and I know that's hard. (laughs) And we can do hard things. We can do the hard thing. Um, The tagline for the series is a a more excellent way, and, and that phrase comes from 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12 is a text where the church is struggling and there are problems, and then Paul says, but I will show you a more excellent way. And that more excellent way is what he talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter that is often called the love chapter. So let's hear that chapter now.
This is the call, the call to love. And while it is often hard, it is our call. And we can do hard things. Love is what makes us become both and people and what helps us walk in this way of Jesus. Okay. So as I was thinking about the text... I was thinking to myself, I wonder what happened next, right? I wonder what this woman did with her life after this experience. I mean, she has this encounter with Jesus who sees her as the complicated person she is, both both the good and the bad in her. And he offers her a chance. He offers her an opportunity. What did she do with that? Well, we don't know. But as I reflect on the text from my own life, it inspires me to remember my own shortcomings, my own faults, and to see others and their shortcomings and faults from a, a bigger perspective, a more godlike perspective, and to make the choice to love, even when it's hard. And when I do, I find that even if we don't see eye to eye, if I'm willing to be a both and person, that we're able to find a way forward together. We're able to make a relationship that matters, and we're able to follow Christ together. We will not all agree with each other. It was never the point to begin with. The point was to learn to love, to learn how to be in relationship, even when it's hard, even when we don't know how. This week, my prayer for you is that you would be willing, and when you are willing, God can do the rest. Let us pray.